The UFC has seen, in theory, its final Korean zombie fight. And UFC Singapore is in the books. So, a big question uh, that I think is being asked is, I don't think a lot of people watch this live. Because timing. It was on at 4 a.m. my time. That's 1 a.m. for like the West Coast. That's still early ass morning for the Europeans um, for a fight on a Saturday. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I, I guess what I'll say is you do want to see the main event. I was worried that Korean zombie Max Holloway was going to be sad, was going to be a bad moment, and, and, and it wasn't. We'll get more into details on that later. The supporting fights were nothing can't miss. Like I'm looking up and down the results here and you could probably skip Anthony Smith, Ryan Spawn. It's in its own way. This sad microcosm of both of their careers. You could probably skip Giga Chikatsi versus Alex Caceres because it's a sad microcosm of Alex Caceres' career. But, you know, Renya Nakamura versus Fernie Garcia, that was fun. Aaron Blanchfield versus Ty- Tyler Santos, that was a good test for Blanchfield that she did pass. Uh, Judo Taffa and Waldo Cortez Acosta scored nice knockouts in relatively quick succession. Scary fall by Lucas Breski, we'll get into that more later. Uh, Garrett Armfield did a good job, showed what he's got, put Kazama away. Oleg Sajic versus Chiji and Jaquani was... All kinds of fun for four minutes and 16 seconds. Uh, Kanan Song versus Rolando Bedoya was not a can't miss, not a go out of your way to see fight, but it was solid. Billy Goff and um, Yasaku Kunishiska uh, was another one. I, I butcher his name. I'm sorry. And I know I shouldn't because it's, um, I watch pro wrestling. And of course, that means a lot of Japanese pro wrestling. And I know his name is pronounced like Takeshita, but I can't. For some reason, it will not click in my brain. I don't know why. Kinoshita. Kinoshita. There, I think I got it. Uh, JJ Aldridge, Neon Long was, or Neon Long was fine. Not great. But it was good to see JJ get a win. And Suhu Choi versus Yarno Aarons was pretty fun. Some weird ass scores online, I'll say that much. But, uh, you know, it was solid. Uh, fight of the night went to Max Holloway, Chan Sung Jung. Performance of the night to Junior Taffa and to Michael Oleksajic. So, I don't know about those two getting the performance of the night. But, you know what? I picked, I did pick both of them to lose. And they both picked up first round stoppages. So, I guess that is, you know, that is a solid reason. Actually, now that I think about it. Uh, winning record on the night, I went 8-5. and five, Or the morning, I should say. And uh, let's just get into the fights. Max Holloway, Chan Sung Jung. Uh, like I said, there was a potential sadness to this fight because, to be honest, both guys are like slipping. Both guys are past their prime. Someone asked me on Twitter, or X as it is now known, what I meant by Max Holloway being like in decline. And I think he thought, uh, I think it was a he. I think he thought that I was saying that Max Holloway was like done, washed, no good, etc. And he's like, he just he just beat a title contender, and he just be, he you know he beat a title uh, a title contender before that, and he lost to Max or to Volkanovski. That's not a problem. It's true. If you look at just the results of Max Holloway's current run, or I guess entire career, it doesn't look like he's in decline. It's one of those ones where you do in fact have to go watch the fights because beating Arnold Allen by decision. That looks cool. Beating Yair Rodriguez by decision. That looks cool. Beating Calvin Cater by decision. That looks cool. And the Cater fight is. like I I would say it's more like the Yair, the Arnold Allen, and the Volkanovski fight. We're like, yeah, he's not quite as fast as he used to be. Doesn't seem to hit quite as hard. Doesn't seem to have as good a counter timing. It's still very, very good. Like when I say in decline, like a guy who's in decline could still be the best fighter in the world at his weight class. There are various examples of that. Like, Kamar Usman was in decline while being the best welterweight in the world before Leon Edwards beat him. 
Like, it, it was true that, like, while... In Kamaro's case, it's a bit of a weird one because, like, Kamaro was picking up new tactics and improving as a technician while obviously losing physicality. And that was why he was in decline. Max is a bit of a different story where, like, Max Max's decline is more traditional. He's just not as fast, as strong, as explosive. He's not as insert physical attribute as he was before. And that happens. And to be clear, it's happening to a guy who I still believe beats everyone in this division, not named Alexander Volkanovsky. So when I say he's declining, he's still the second best fighter in the world at his weight class. And the only guy better than him, Volkanovsky, is possibly, entirely possibly, the best pound-for-pound fighter on the planet right now. So he is still incredibly good. But he is in decline. And Zombie is in a very obvious decline. And again, it's not Zombie's losses. Because if you look at Zombie's losses here for a moment, it's another case where, like, if you just you just look at the topology, just envision the topology, losing to Volkanovski and Ortega, not a problem. Losing to Yair Rodriguez, not a problem. Still beating Frank Yeager, Hanato Bocano, Dan Ige. Like, this looks like a fighter who's still perfectly fine. But then you go back and watch the Ortega fight. You watch the Volkanovski fight. And I'm not saying that decline led to the losses. I'm saying that it's very clear that he's not as insert thing as he was before. And particularly with Zombie, the big problem is he's never been inhumanly durable. I mean, this is a guy that got knocked out by George Roop. So it's, it's not that he's absolutely unshakable. It's that the number of times he's getting hurt is going up and up and up and up. And that is a problem when the best element of your game is the ability to take one to give one. Because the zombie is a very solid brawler and, and, and counter pressure fighter. Like that's what he does. But it's not through a mastery of defense. It's through a fearlessness, and enough durability that the chances of getting knocked out in one shot are very low. And in the first round of this fight, we kind of got a look at the best of both guys. You know, in a competitive stance. Holloway was fishing for openings. He was hitting a lot of feints. Zombie was biting on a lot of those feints. And that did eventually set up some things in the second round, specifically. They, particularly Holloway, loves this... um, level change, you do a left hand that he loves to do, which actually, ironically, Zombie hit him with in the start of the second round. But the first round was kind of like a sparring session. Getting the reads, Holloway landing more, but like a sparring session where they were absolutely throwing with mean intentions. Like there was some heavy shots landed. There were some stuns. There was some backpedaling going on by both guys in the round. Sorry, I have a water bottle kind of perched here um anyways and then in the second round you know like i said zombie comes out hits that nice level change into a left hook very nice i don't i i can't recall him doing that before but i'm sure he has i'm sure that's not something he just copied from from max but it was funny it was interesting and then he gets dropped in almost anaconda and i I, honestly i'm not sure how he didn't get finished with the anaconda choke uh that was that that looked tight. That looked exceptionally tight. And Max didn't finish him. Um, also showed showed great respect and restraint. Because I, I think in a normal fight, I think in a normal fight where Holloway is fighting somebody, standing between him and a title shot, and another up and co- like an up-and-comer, he just pounds away and probably gets the finish right there instead of going for the choke. That's my gut feeling. But there was a respectfulness throughout the fight where, like, I don't think he really wanted to hurt the zombie. And that led us to the best retirement fight that you're going to get. Because, you know, like I said, almost finished in the second round. We got that great showing of heart, that great showing of determination. Finish out the round. And then the third round, zombie is just like, all right, we are going to do this Leonard Garcia style. We're going to go out there and bang. And he's... He's he's clipping Holloway. He's doing good things. He ha- he's having that nostalgic moment of the zombie. 
And then he gets knocked out with a big right hand. <laughs> Just instantly face pl plants. No need for follow-up. Holloway celebrates the victory. He gives all the shine to Zombie that he can. He's like, he's ask, he, he checks on him. He helps him up. They embrace. He's like, you know, pointing to him and uses part of his interview to be like, this is a legend. Louder. Louder. Um, pure class. Love Max Holloway. Big fan. And, um, you know, and then he talks about Hawaii. Of course, there's the wildfires in Hawaii are destroying so much. And, you know, he's been doing a lot to lead effort into trying to direct uh, financial assistance to where it needs to go. There's, of course, a lot of thoughts and prayers stuff because, you know, he's a big old Christian. And um, and we we know I don't I don't I don't subscribe. I don't I don't I don't, I don't have time for it. The the whole big Christian bit. I, I just don't. I've always I've always found the. Um, Everything I do is powerful through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ thing at the end of fights to be um, just lame. Not even in an anti-religious sense, just lame in a sense of like, this is how you, you know, practice your your faith in God. I, I, I don't know. But but it, in, in this case, in this case, uh, I had a lot of time for it. And then Zombie got in there to uh, basically announce his retirement. I hope it sticks. I have I have a long honed um, suspicion, skepticism in regards to fighter retirements because they so often don't end up being retirements. But he, you know, he said it. Uh, I wanted to be champion. I don't think I can anymore, and I don't think I'm going to fight anymore. So I, I I hope that ends up being the case because this was great. This. This was a retirement fight against one of the best fighters on the planet that he got to show and look good at points and show his heart and show his determination and go three rounds. Well, two and, a, two and change. And still look like he had a little something, something. So, like, that, it's not going to get better. Um, I mean, I guess a win would be better, but, like, I, I don't even know if a win would be better. Because of the competition level. For Max's next opponent, it's very, very weird. Because uh, I, I said already in this podcast that Max is probably the second best fighter in the division. Honestly. Like, I, I could see Ilya Teporia beating him. Like, there is that possibility. There is that option. There, there are people that I would consider him losing to. But, like, in terms of achievements, in terms of current, current form, he's the man. But behind Volk. But at the same time, because he's lost to Volk three times, you don't want him in that title picture. You just honestly don't. Like, it, it doesn't... Unless he loses, it doesn't serve anything. Like, the, the Arnold Allen fight was a perfect example of this. It's like, you go in there with Arnold Allen having all kinds of noise about being a future title contender, and then he loses. And, like, all that hype is gone. All of it. But you don't want him fighting nobodies you don't want him fighting raw prospects or scrubs or i mean i guess you kind of you know you kind of could do something like this zombie fight with somebody else who's coming to the end of their career maybe you could do josh emmett that's on the table but i am going to propose the winner of edson barbosa sadiq yusuf because i don't honestly see yusuf as a title contender I just think that there is there is an X factor missing from him. There's a lot of physicality. There's a, there is a lot of ability. I'm a big fan. And I'm a big fan of his casual breakdowns. But there is just something I can't I can't put him in that top level of division. And Barboza would be a great uh, a great legends fight coming off a big win against Yusuf if he wins. So I like that one. I like it a lot. And like I said, Zombie hopefully is retiring. Uh, Anthony Smith, Ryan Spawn. Uh, I scored this round one to Spawn, round two, or round one to Smith, round two and three to Spawn. The third round is an absolute push. If you scored it for Spawn, that is perfectly fine. Uh, or pardon me for Smith, that's perfectly fine. I'm good with it, honestly. Um, Smith looked very, very good with the low kicks early on, which is ironic because like it is, it is really, really, really weird that Anthony Smith, who is 
one of the better low kickers in the 205 division. Like, honestly, like if, if I were to say, what is his best thing? That's actually what it is. Yet he is so incapable of defending them. Like, it is just it is just weird. Um, but he got the job done there. Spawn had him hurt badly in the second round. My Lord. He slipped a shot, landed a massive big left. There, there was a jumping knee in there that I don't think actually even really landed Smith's eye is blown up. He's covering up. He's got his hands super high, super, super high. If Spawn was smarter, he could, you know, go for the body, but not really. There's a point on the ground where Smith is going for a knee bar. It's not close. It's really not. Then they're back on the feet. Like I said, the body is wide open. Please do that. And somehow we end up getting to the end of the round. Uh, Because two minutes are just... The last two minutes of the round are just honestly dull. Um, now, part of that is, of course, Spawn appeared to have a hard time, like a really, really hard time putting weight on his leg. By the way, two weeks in a row that low kicks are a big part of things. Just saying. We need to put respect on low kicks again. I don't know why it keeps leaving them. But like, we know they're da- dangerous, and like, and yet somehow we end up like constantly not scoring them. Um, and then, like I said, the third round is... The third round is Spawn trying to... Figure out what he can do on kind of one leg because, like, he's clearly not standing on it well. And Smith is cautious because, you know, his eye is destroyed. Um, now, the eye actually turned out to be, like, the, the swelling uh, find up. He ended up being, like, absolutely fine. Like, it looked it looked way worse than it was uh, or way worse than it actually ended up being. But, like, you know, he's got a messed up eye and he's going out there. and You know, a lot of jab supremacy being trying to establish between two guys who are used to being able to control the range and can't necessarily against each other. Smith, by the way, landing. At one point in this fight, Smith was landing 64% of his strikes. Good God, Ryan Spawn. Defense, man. God, please. Um, Smith had more volume and Spawn, I thought, had more quality. There you go. But really, really close third round. Fine with the split decision. Um... I guess I'm, I'm. I guess the thing out of this is that like I, I'm not going to feel worried about Anthony Smith's mental health coming out of it. At no point did he um, start talking about people attacking his family. That's that's good. It's good. Uh, he survived adversity, and I, I don't know. He has had the Anthony Smith has had the weirdest career of any MMA fighter in history. Bar none. Like, Robbie Lawler's career is weird. This is even weirder. Um, anyways, he got the win. I've got him against Nikita Krylov. I've got Spawn against Khalil Roundtree because, I mean, it's an informative fight. Spawn is a guy who is going to have the physicality and the size to compete with Roundtree. What does Roundtree do? Uh, and at the same time, like, Spawn will have to pay attention to his defense because Roundtree hits like a truck. Uh, Caceres versus Giga Chikatsi. I don't have a lot of good things to say about the fight. Caceres had a early on range advantage or volume advantage, I should say. Giga started getting not higher volume, but like more pressing when he wanted to do it. Like in like the first round was Giga throwing single shot with no real follow up, no real game plan. The second and the third round was him going in there and being like, all right, what if I jab jab into a into a body kick what if i jab into a right hand what if i double jab into a right hand what if i what if i do actual combination things that i should be doing every time um and he just basically at that point started taking caceres apart and it wasn't amazing it wasn't great it's not a fight you should honestly even bother going to watch because it's caceres shitting the bed because it's what caceres does giga had kind of like a fake retirement thing going on there like he was you know low and remorseful voice talking about the struggles he'd been going through and then just you know yells giga is back and i want to be on the pay-per-view in december it was a bit lame but hey the crowd liked it so there you go uh giga i've got against josh emmett if you don't do holloway versus emmett and for caceres i've got like jonathan pierce because i don't care 
I honestly don't care about Caceres. He's had a long time of me like being like, all right, is this going to be the time that this five foot ten featherweight, seventy and a half, seventy three and a half inch reach guy who used to fight at bantamweight at one point is this the moment he's gonna? Yeah, it's not happening. He's thirty five years old. I've, I've given up on it. His fights are plenty exciting. Like I'm not saying I'm. I want to be clear on this. I'm not saying cut him. I'm not saying I'm skipping his next fight. I'm just not summoning up a care for his next fight. Like that's just that's what it is. I tire of watching a guy fight. <sighs> fight dumb. Fight dumb. Sorry, my phone was making a noise there. Rinya Nakamura, Fernie Garcia. Rinya Nakamura did his thing. Like he showed off his superior wrestling. Um, there was some good grappling there. There was some excellent phase shifts. There's some great scrambling. Everything I expected him to have. Fernie Garcia was not able to honestly really get things done here. Um, he was re- he was caught in a deep arm bar. Managed to get out of it. I don't have much else to say about the fight. Like it was a very impressive performance. It was the first it was the first time Nakamura fought someone with any kind of respectable skills. But like at the same time, it was still a fight where he could do whatever he wanted because he's a phenomenal athlete and and a beast. Um, for his next fight, I had Brady Heastan, who's another guy who kind of did everything he wanted against Fernie, he- uh, Fernie Garcia as a wrestler. So let's see if he can do that again. He is a better striker than Heastan for sure and probably a better athlete. But like his stand-up is still um, offensively potent with like not a lot of structure and at the same time defensively void. So there you go. Uh, for Fernie Garcia, I've just got some Dana White contender series fodder for him. The guy is 0-3, if I'm not mistaken, in the UFC since winning his Dana White contender series fight. And they're all two pretty okay fighters. Journey Newsome, Brady Heastan, Rinya Nakamura. This was, a, this was the hardest battle of the bunch. But like, he does just seem to be not athletic enough. But like, at the same time, he's a great gatekeeper. Uh, the vivisection guys uh, talked about being a gatekeeper and obviously like being a gatekeeper, like you're going to, if you hear someone say you're a gatekeeper, you're going to take that offensively because you're trying to be a champion. Like that is the idea behind every fighter from bottom to top. They're trying to be champions. So I get why it's offensive, but like, it's a statement of quality. Like if you can beat Fernie Garcia, there's a chance that you are going to do something in the UFC because he is well-rounded he is the sort of guy that can make, not in this case, but in some cases, can probably make somebody look a lot worse than they actually are. And that's a heck of a, that's a great, like, first line introduction to the UFC's Bantamweight division. And it's a role I I, I don't mind seeing him fulfill for a long time. But he is 0-3. And, and there's no real upward moment, momentum. Uh, Aaron Blanchfield, Tyler Santos. Uh, I scored round one for Santos. I scored rounds two and three for Blanchfield. Basically, this fight was, okay, what happens if Blanchfield cannot just instantly get takedowns in the clinch, but is still stronger than somebody? And we got our answer. She was persistent. And even though her straight, her stand-up does not look good, I want to make that clear, does not look good. And I want to say she went, uh, uh, they mentioned on the broadcast she was 0 for 12 on takedowns did that is that the official number over 14 so like over 14 on takedowns but able to just kind of smother santos with activity tire her out wear her down and that was basically it santos could not keep up the pace uh that she needed to um if we look at this per round uh santos landed 25 of 71 strikes or uh significant strikes in the first round 31 of 80 overall then it was down to 32 of 48, uh, 48, and then, uh, yeah, 33 out of 74 in the third round, surprisingly enough. But a lot of uh, non-significant strikes there. She was 19 of 56 on six strikes. So, like, the six strike attempts, 71 in the first round, and then 80 for the rest of the fight. Yeah, couldn't keep up the pace, and that was the key. Um... Blanchfield probably get a title shot off of this because there's a lot of hype behind her. I personally, I would like to see this take more time. Honestly, because she's getting better every fight. I appreciate that. I would like to see that continue. I honestly would like this 
this was a huge step up in competition for her, and uh, as was the Jessica Andrade fight, and she passed both of them, not with flying colors in this, but in this case, she went to decision here and you know lost a round, pretty convincingly in the first round, I thought. But um, she showed that if, even if you can resist her takedowns, if you can make it difficult for her, she'll keep going, she'll keep grinding it, she'll keep pressuring it, she'll keep getting the work done. But I, I do think that the title shot is next. And for Santos, I've got Macy Barber. Because that would be phenomenal. Because Macy Barber is kind of in a... Not the same boat as Aaron Blanchfield. Because I trust her a lot less. But she's a physically gifted fighter that I am... Despite the fact that she annoys me. I want to see her do really well. I want to see this division get better and better and better. And have more and more talent at the top. That has like the physicality to take a fight to a Valentina Shevchenko. Because that was the thing when Valentina was raiding out the division. It was her repetitively against f- fighters that... It's not that she's not talented as a fighter, but that she could just out Haas. And people like Blanchfield and Santos, to a lesser extent, and uh, and um, and Barber coming up are people who can like actually challenge that. And it leads to good fights. It leads to interesting stuff. So let's do it. Uh, Junior Taffa melted Parker Porter. I, I don't... I don't have a lot else to say about it. Um, I picked Parker Porter, and obviously I even said in my in my pick that early on in this fight, Junior Toff is going to get the opportunity to melt him, and if he does, he's going to win the fight, and and he did. I've got Toff against Chris Barnett. I've got Porter against somebody coming up to Dana White series. I like Porter. I really do. I appreciate a guy with the hard work ethic and trying to make the most out of himself and slimming down and 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 just living his best life. I appreciate that a ton, but he lacks really, really top end heavyweight durability. He starts a little bit slow and he's not a phenomenal athlete in any way, shape or form. So he is kind of in a Fernie Garcia-esque role where it's like, welcome to the heavyweight division. Here's Parker Porter. What can you do against that? And uh, if you're Braxton Smith, he'll beat you down. If you're Junior Taffa, apparently he'll not, you'll get, you'll knock him out. Waldo Cortez Acosta versus Lucas Breschke. Uh, Waldo looked good here. This was one of the scariest falls on a knockout I've ever seen because uh, Breschke was kind of semi back to uh, Waldo when he got hit with the uh, the big hook that just put him down. But like he, like yeah, and he was stanky legging. Like he was uh, he was he was off balance in a big way, and he just face planted head first into the mat. Somebody get that man a neck CT or whatever the appropriate scan is because uh given 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 the recent um given the recent uh ufc medical practice uh track record they may not do that <laughs> so, some somebody do that somebody do that um it was good to see both get out there and be a little bit more assertive and and be a little more aggressive and and yeah i i liked it i liked it um I liked it a lot. He added a lot of low kicking to his game as well. I mean, it's always been there. He's always been a low kicker, but like more there, more velocity, more volume, and uh, got the job done. So, bravo, bravo, bravo! I've got the winner of Justin Toff versus Austin Lane for him, and I've got Bresky taking some time off because I suspect there's something wrong with his neck after that. That it would it would boggle my mind if there's not some kind of injury there. I'm not saying he's going to die. Or, or forced to retire. But I, I do suspect uh, he'll have a little bit of time on the shelf. Uh, Garrett Armfield more or less just wrecked uh, Toshimo Kazama. Um, I don't like moving away from Kill Cliff MMA to, I think they said it was Marathon MMA that he's with now. Let me see here. Does does Tapology have an updated gym? Now they still have him at a Kill Cliff. Um... I don't even know Marathon, except that it was apparently it's Trey Ogden's gym. And maybe Trey Ogden's a really good coach, and I'm just unaware of it. Marathon MMA, Kansas City, yeah. Uh, Stephen Graham trains out of there. He's okay. Mike Breeden. It's not exactly blowing me away. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not blown away. There's a couple of like uh, young looking dudes. Uh, Zach Scroggin. Is five and zero, oh. and Nick Mech. Let's see here. How big are they? 
Uh, Scroggins a big ass welterweight. Ooh, six foot three, one seventy. That's that's big. And Mech is a five foot ten welterweight. So that's like the complete opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, yeah, I'm just, mm, I, I I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm not really, uh, not really super warm to the idea. I guess in a nutshell. Uh, anyways, uh, he did look good. He did get the job done. I've got him against Tony Kelly as a, a if Kelly's still around, uh, as a surprisingly like fun option. Um, Kelly may have been cut after his like stuff with Brazilians. Um, I doubt it though. <laughs> uh, so put that fight together and I've got Kazama against Dana White Contender Series fodder because They'll probably keep him around because he's a finalist from the road to the UFC, losing to Rinya Nakamura. But like, he is just, he's not good. He's not good. I don't even really honestly think that he has that Fernie Garcia gatekeeping potential to him. Uh, Chidi Njikwani, Mikel Oaksajic. This was fun. This was loads of fun. Um, yeah, they went out there and the, the, they, they, Chidi showed completely bad fight IQ by like, continuously pressing for the takedown, obviously. And then, like, when it did end up on the ground, Oleg Sajic would be on top, and Oleg Sajic would be hitting him with, like, ground and pound, and then, like, he would go for a submission that didn't really have anything to it, and Oleg Sajic would be, like, stand up and, like, wave him back to his feet. Like, so that was not great. That had me that had me yelling at, at there, but, like, they both, they both did their stuff. They both went out there, and they had chaotic violence. Go watch the fight. I... I can't break it down technically because I don't really think that there is a technical breakdown for it. It was just fun watching. Go do yourself a favor and watch it. Because they're both appointment viewing. Oleg Sajic wants a ranked foe. I got no issue with that, but I I, I don't think the performance actually banned it. I had him, I had him, I had him losing, and he seemed very, very gassed at the end of the post fight. Which is weird, because like, I don't know. He does seem to be a guy who fights like he has better cardio than he actually does, which is concerning. Um, but like, ah, uh, I could see him fighting like the winner of the Roman Kopolov Josh Friend fight, preferably Kopolov, because I think him and Kopolov would be really fun. And for Chidi, I've got Abus Magomedov because the UFC tried to make a thing out of Magomedov by having a main event against, uh, Sean Strickland, I think with the idea that he would be way, way, way better than he was. I, I legitimately think that with Abus Magomedov, the, and this is, applies to some other people with similar names. They just assume that they've got mi- another like version of Habib. Like I honestly think that that's the case. And they just didn't realize that Abus is not actually all that good. <laughs> like <laughs> feel like they just know that Dana White likes guys from the Caucasus with a certain ring to their name. Uh Kadan Song Rolando Bedoya. Uh Bedoya had amazing volume the first round that he just couldn't quite keep up. Like he was, he was doing his thing, uh, but as the fight went on, he kept trying to do like take down stuff, and it wasn't working. In the second round, there was a, a Bradley Martin um, <clears throat> prat fest from Paul Felder and Michael Bisping, where they were talking about Bedoya's somewhat lackluster looking physique. Man does look like he's a pu- a puffy uh, lightweight, unfortunately. Um, and they, you know. I've been waiting for someone on like a UFC broadcast to say this because that Bradley Barton's an idiot. So I was I was happy about that. And um, Song stepped up his own volume. He became a little bit more combination focused, a little bit more not not super deep. Still not a pace fighter, not a high volume fighter, but like he was able to hurt Bedoya pretty badly. In the second and third round, which was huge, he was able to keep the pace a little bit more. Let's see here. What were the pace numbers in this fight? We refer to the UFC stats once again. Uh, Song versus Bedoya. Yeah, Bedoya outlanded him 112 to 75 in the fight. Significant strikes. 32-16 in the opening one. Yeah, Song brought him up to a 24 and then 35. So yeah, there you go. Had him hurt a couple times. Uh, was given a knockdown in the third round, not in the second round. I think he knocked uh, Bedoya to a knee in the second round. And uh, yeah, I, I said in this fight that like if that song was going to be relying on have, on being able to hurt Bedoya, and you know what? He did that in two out of three rounds. There you go. That's the way. 
Uh, I've got Song against Marley Alves. I think that would be a really fun fight. And I've got Bedoya against the winner of Reese McKee, Angelosa. Particularly if it's Angelosa, I think that would be a really, really fun fight. Uh, Kinoshita versus Billy Goff. Kinoshita landed some really, 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 really good shots. Like, very, very good sharps. Looks, you know, looked sharp on a lot of the jabs and a couple of, like, you know, nice head kicks. Body kicks. Uh, but Goff just kind of kept pressuring him. And hurt him with a body shot. Put him down. Pounded him out. I'm still not convinced Goff is actually going to be particularly good. Uh, I still think, actually, like, honestly, if you're asking me uh, for my prediction here, I think in, like, 10 years, because Kino Shida is only 23, like, the chances that Kino Shida is 33 years old and, like, still fighting at a high level in MMA versus Goff at 35 years old fighting at a high level in MMA, even if, even and even even if Goff wasn't older, uh, I would pick Kishida because there's there's some physicality there that like makes a lot of sense, and Goff is just a mess, <laughs> just a mess. But he will beat some people if you, if you don't like pressure, Goff will beat you. <laughs> um, I've got Goff against Basil Hafez because um, Basil is a guy who has a lot of like you know because of his performance against Jack Della Maddalena. It either like brought people out thinking Basel is way better than he is, or that Jack Della Maddalena is not good. Realistically, I still don't think Basel Hafez is all that great. I thought he was fine. I thought he was fine. I thought he was a fine UFC addition. But like put him in there with Billy with Billy Goff and let's see what happens. And uh for Kinoshita, I don't know. He's been beaten by Adam Few getting by Billy Goff now. So like any idea that like he has stock right at this second, pretty low. I think he just gets another white Dana White contender series grad. Basically like this one. He gets he gets this fight again, basically. And we see what he can do. Uh, J.J. Aldridge wrecked Na Leong, uh, stopping her in the second round. It uh, looks like uh, Na broke her foot at some point in the fight. Not really sure when. It was good to see J.J. Aldridge go out there and, and, just, and just win. And just win. Because we've seen a lot of losing from Aldridge. And she is she is absolutely physically limited. There is things she cannot do, but she is an incredibly good test for fighters coming in. Again, kind of in that Fernie Garcia mold, but like a little bit higher up in the food chain. And uh, I've got her against Montana De La Rosa because Montana De La Rosa is kind of the same thing. So I want to see, I want to see that kind of fight. I want to see that like it's got a little bit of profile to it. It's got a little bit of gatekeeper to the upper levels. Let it happen. And for Montana, she just lost to Tatiana Suarez in her last fight which is just not fair to her because Suarez is a destroyer of worlds and probably a future ch- future title contender if not champion and uh that would be that would be fun. By the way, it was still weird seeing Blanchfield versus uh versus uh Santos uh not in the co-main event, not in the main event. Um I get not in the main event cuz Zombie is a Asian legend. Max Holloway is one of the best fighters in the world. Obviously that's a big one, but like co-main. Ladies get the co-main. None of this Anthony Smith Versus uh, Ryan Spawn stuff, please. Uh, so with Choi versus Yarno Aaron's first round, I thought went to Choi. Uh, second round went to Aaron's. Third round went to Choi. Uh, Aaron's, I think, actually had an absolutely like bad, bad, bad leg, um, and he went down. He went down to a basically a kick right to the. Uh, right to the knee and uh, put him on his butt. And uh, Troy had great back control for the last little bit. Tried to go for a naked choke, did his thing. He's just a more technical version. Yarno Aaron's is the best. Like, that's what it is. Like Yarno, Yarno Aaron's feels like quadruple A fighter, like Julian Arosa style thing where it's like what we thought of is Arosa before. Like Arosa at least has like freakish physicality to him in terms of just height, which I guess Aaron's has a little bit of. He's five foot 11. But, like, on a technical level, he got picked apart here by Suwo Choi. And hopefully, hopefully this is a turning of the corner for Choi because I've been waiting for this guy to be a big thing, to be, like, a quality addition to the featherweight division and to do his thing, and he keeps losing on me. Um, he, he is a fighter I have had absolutely garbage luck picking his fights. Um, and there's a reason he's 11-6. and six. Like, Losing li- like losing to Mozar Ivalev, not a problem. Perfectly fine. Losing to Gavin Tucker in your second fight, eh, not a problem. 
beat Mokhtari and beat Yusuf Zalal, beat Julian Rosa, speaking of Julian Rosa. But then, like, the losses to Josh Kulabau, the loss to Michael Trezano, really problematic. And at least he got this win over Aaron's. Avoids getting cut because four straight losses. I think assuredly would have. Um, I've got Sean Woodson again for him next because they're two, they're both freakishly tall dudes. And I want to see that morbid curiosity play out into something. <laughs> And for Yarno Aarons, like I said, he's, uh, well, I don't know if I said it, but I'll say it now. He's in that Fernie Garcia mold where, like, there's some physicality to him. There's some weird stuff to him that is fun and messy. And he's probably going to be a Dana White contender series. Welcome to the UFC type of guy who welcomes you to the promotion and either beats you up and you're not ready or you beat him up and you're probably ready. (laughs) That's probably what it boils down to. Honestly. So there you go. Uh, down below, you'll find a bunch of like links to my social medias, my Discord, the fight uh, simulator is there. And tonight, actually, uh, I'm going to be running uh, our Bloody Mania card for the month, which is basically kind of like a old school UFC, no rules, no holds barred type of MMA environment. And uh, we're going to have fun with that. We're going to have fun. That's some of the mo- some of the most fun we ever get. So you might want to check that out. You might want to check me out on Twitter. There's other places you can find the uh, podcast. And there's also my gaming stuff. Stream Super Mega Baseball and also do Mech Warrior 5 and Mech Warrior Online content. There you go. There's my plugs. Have a good day.